Hey everybody, Cybertel back at you with all things chess. Uh, we're going to take a departure from our plans, as a lot of you chess fans might have, might have heard. Um, yesterday marked the passing of Evgeny Sveshnikov, uh, one of my personal favorite chess players, especially when I was growing up. Um, he was a Russian Latvian Grandmaster, he was born in 1950, uh, earned the International Master title in 1975, earned the Grandmaster title two years later in 77. A uh, great player in his own right. He won many strong tournaments, had excellent results. He was really known as a theoretician, though. Um, of course, the uh, main variation, and this is, we're going to be going over some tribute games of his in the next few days, just games that I think are most representative of his style, his contribution to opening theory. Um, but the opening system that he's most known for is, of course, the Sveshnikov variation of the Sicilian. Um, of course, before Sveshnikov uh, came along and really did some work in this, now, to be clear up front, he did a lot of work in conjunction with another very strong grandmaster, Gennady Timoshenko. Um, so it wasn't just Sveshnikov that was helping create this opening variation more or less out of whole cloth. Uh, Timoshenko did a lot of valuable work in this as well. Um, that's why in Russia, it's actually more likely to be known as the Chelyabinsk variation because both gentlemen are so tied to the opening variation. Um, but in the West, especially, it's known as the Sveshnikov variation. Um, but anyways, um, before Sve Sveshnikov and Timoshenko came across this opening variation in the 60s and 70s, uh, this was called the Lasker Pelican. Uh, Emmanuel Lasker in the teens and 20s occasionally used this uh, if he were in a must-win situation or if he was just looking for a zany fight. Um, after that, the main contributor was an international master named Jiri Pelican. A uh, Czech Argentine uh, international master. Um, but even by the 60s, it really didn't have much of any theoretical imprint at all. I believe Ludwig Pachmann uh, did a little bit of theoretical work on it, but very sparse stuff. Th this opening variation basically didn't exist before Sveshnikov and Timoshenko came along. Um, so Sveshnikov's contribution to this, it has been called by some as the last great opening discovery. Um, it's really hard nowadays for a new opening to be created on move five. Um, and this is more or less what Sveshnikov and Timoshenko did in the 60s and 70s. Um, this is part of the revolution of the 70s that Kasparov was talking about in one of his great predecessor's books. There was a humongous leap forward in terms of preparation, quality of preparation, stuff like that. Um, another thing Sveshnikov is known for, and this is something I re really admire about him, he was a um, huge fulminator for the rights of chess players. Uh, one thing that he really fulminated for was chess players to automatically earn the copyright ownership of games that they have played, which I absolutely agree with. You know, labor deserves every bit of the fruits of their labor. Uh, chess players are performing a skill of labor. Why shouldn't they own the games that they create? Um, just a quick theoretical question. Why is it chess base gets to profit from the games of chess players, but not the chess players themselves? That's a good question. Um, so Sveshnikov was really fulminating for this back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, also, real quick, the other opening variations he was known for, he was known for a lot of work in the C3 Sicilian. Um, before he came along, this was played, but it was a very much a minor line. Sveshnikov pretty much brought this line into being all by himself through his popularization. I will say that he played it much more aggressively than a lot of play people play the uh, C3 Sicilian now. A lot of white players will play the C3 Sicilian for uh, sort of an endgame advantage or something more quiet. Sveshnikov played it quite aggressively. Um, and then the reason I personally admired Yevgeny Sveshnikov when I was growing up, I played E4 back in the day, and my choice against the French was the advanced French with E5. Um, before Sveshnikov's work, the advanced French had become sort of a languid, overgrown with moss option. It really didn't see much action. Um, his work really brought it back into the fore and brought it a lot of popularity. Um, so we'll be looking at games about the C3 Sicilian and the advanced French in the coming days, just to sort of a, my personal tribute to Yevgeny Sveshnikov. Um, just one more addition before we um, go on to look at this game that I selected to highlight this Sveshnikov Sicilian. Um, he, he passed away at the age of 71. He was born in, in 1950. 
Um, he refused to get vaccinated against COVID and also refused to wear any sort of protective material, even after his son had been briefly hospitalized with COVID. Um, please, please protect yourselves, guys. I, I don't want to make this political. I don't want to get in an argument with anyone. Just just protect yourself. You, you don't get another life, so try to make this one as good as you can. That's all I'll say. Um, so th this game was played in 1974. This was against Vitaly uh, uh, Sheshkovsky against Yevgeny Sleshnikov on the black side. So we get... This is the basic position of the Sveshnikov Sicilian. Uh, the main move here is bishop g5. Modern theory has sort of started to stray away from this, uh, especially after Magnus Carlsen. In Carlsen's match against uh, Caruana, we saw knight d5 quite a bit instead. Um, and this really looks to play a much more quiet game, where... Basically, we have sort of this quasi-King's Indian structure, um, where white has this queen-side majority, black has this king-side majority, and so much more nuanced and positional game than some of the more outrageous variations of the Sveshnikov. Back in the seven, uh, 60s and 70s and 80s, these more outrageous positions were completely unknown, so they had, still had a lot of scope for play. Now these modern main lines in these outrageous positions, they've all been analyzed very thoroughly. Um, in the 70s and 80s, the Sveshnikov Sassain was a winning weapon. Now it's much more of a drawing weapon, because so mu there, there's so much theory that exists on it that it's hard to find a unique position. Um, so that, that's why in the Carlson Caruana match in uh, 2018, you did see this much more positional variation that still had a lot of scope for play and ideas and trying to outplay one another. Uh, but back in 1974, you know, even this main line basically had no theory on it, so it was the wild, wild west. You could basically play any line here for a win. So, bishop g5, this is the most logical, of course. Really, the reason why no one really gave this opening a, a second look before Sveshnikov and Timoshenko was this hole on d5. As you'll notice, there's no black pawn that can control this square on d5 anymore, so any white knight that jumps in there is going to be sort of in an internal outpost. Um... So back when uh, Lasker was uh, fooling around with this opening, you know, back in the classical eras of the 40s and 50s and the 60s, a positional defect like this was considered fatal. It was just sort of against the strict positional rules that existed back then. With the dynamics of modern chess, we realize now that a hole like that can be counterbalanced by other factors. It's not immediately decisive. It's, it's okay to have a positional flaw as long as you're getting proper play for it. Um, and Sveshnikov and Timoshenko did all the hard work to show that black is getting at least enough play for that hole in d5. So bishop g5, a6, knight of 3. Another nice part about this Sveshnikov, you're driving this white knight back to this incredibly passive square in a3. Um, that's, that's time gain, and that does help make up for the hole in d5 as well. So b5, threatening b4. Uh, bishop x f6, this used to be... Sort of a co-equal main line with knight d5. I would say knight d5 is pretty much taken over as the main line against the Sveshnikov. The bishop x f6 lines just didn't work out tactically. There were a lot of uh, crazy white attempts to overtake black's position. It just didn't work out. Knight d5 is the much more controlled positional way of trying to gain an advantage from here. Uh, but bishop, again, this was back in 1974, so you know, as good as these players were, they just didn't know any opening theory here, so they were sort of groping in the dark. And this comes into play later in the game. Bishop takes GX. So this is the hallmark of the Sveshnikov Sicilian. When you first look at these pawns, it looks incredibly ugly. You know, you've got these double black pawns. You've got these holes on F5 and D5. If you could suddenly teleport these knights to, let's say, one knight on E3, the other knight on D5, black's position would be completely dead. You know, if white can control these two squares, that's the game. But the problem is, is that black is simply breaking out far too quickly for white to be able to control everything. Black has the bishop here. That, that is a huge asset in its own right. These f-pawns are basically going to be battering rams against white's center. You know, black will look to immediately play f5, and then after he's played that one f5, he'll have another f5 in reserve. So it's like he has two, two pawn breaks to erode white's control of the center. Uh, that's 
that's pretty valuable to have. Um, that sort of makes these not bad double pawns. Uh, these pawns are Im immediately able to start fighting for the center, which is what you want to be classically doing for the center. Um, so knight d5, f5, again, just immediately fighting for the center. Black doesn't want to give white time to try to control the d5 and the f5 square, so he immediately gets that pawn break in. That's sort of the the hallmark of the Sveshnikov's to say in that f5 pawn break, immediately fighting for the center. Bishop e3, bishop a6. So that prevents e, x, e, f5, because the 9 and d5 would be hanging. Queen h5. This is still uh, popular in modern times. Um, it's just not working, though. I, I just don't think this is... The queen pops out to try to create tactical threats, but none of the tactical threats really work out for, for white. Um, castle is the modern main line. Oops. C3. Um, and this is a very tough fight to come. Uh, this is actually this course that we were just doing, we're still going to be doing, uh, hanging pawns. This should really remind you of these hanging pawns. These are both a strength and a weakness at the same time. If white can get one of these to advance, then he has a good chance of trying to blockade those pawns. But in the meantime, these pawns control very valuable squares, they control space, they can advance at an appropriate time. Um, so this is a very double-edged position. This is perfectly balanced. Queen h5, I just think, isn't proper. Uh, bishop g7 was played. Not the most accurate. Rook g8 is shown to be the most accurate, both by an engine in theory and by looking at myself. Um, it's just showing that the white queen isn't actually creating threats. That pressure on the g-file, that immediate development, is quite valuable for black. g3, notice that queen xh7 just isn't working. The knight can't get to f6 in time. Um, yeah, this is just nearly winning for black, more or less. So g3, g5. Um, as usual, I'll have the annotated game in the notes so you can check out some of the variations I skip over for video time length. Um, and in this position, this is a dream Sveshnikov for black. You know, he's got the bishop pair. He's gained some extra time with rook g8 and rook g5. He's got that f5 break in. This is a fantastic, a fantastic position for black. This is at least equal, if not a little bit better. So bishop g7, not the most accurate, but it's still fine. Castle g4. So this is, it looks scary, uh, but this simply isn't accurate. This is just giving away a pawn. Ex f5 is the modern way of handling this. So f6, threatening mate, so white, black's reply is forced. Rook e8. Um, and this, this is one of the modern main lines from uh, this position, and this is pretty much finely balanced. Um, Black's kingside has been shattered, uh, but that pawn on g7 can basically act as a permanent shield for Black's king to enhance king safety, whereas this pawn on e4 is controlling quite a bit of central space. Black has better development. This queen on h5 is going to lose even more time moving around. Um, this is a balanced position, whereas after g4, this is just dumping a pawn where white doesn't need to. So f takes... Knight c2, knight e3 is a little bit better, but it's still not working. King h8, knight ac2, notice knight xg4 doesn't actually accomplish anything. Um, black's king side is perfectly safe. This bishop on d3 still doesn't have access, so that makes black's king very much safe. This knight's going to hop to f4, and that's going to be decisive for black. Knight ac2, f5. So this is um, a key move, and if you plan on playing the Sveshnikov to say in, this pawn break with f5, it sort of needs to be tattooed into your soul, that you're always looking for this pawn break. Uh, it is the key break for black to always be on the lookout for, no matter what position you're in. Um, x5, then d5. Um, I skipped one line, you can look at that in the notes, uh, but this is what I consider to be the main line for the sub-variation. Uh, black is down two pawns. And white even has this nice pass pawn on f5. But black's bishop pair, his central domination, and black uh, black's king is actually much safer than white's king. You know, this pawn on f5, white would actually sort of wish that that pawn were gone so that bishop would actually be involved in the game. As it is, black's king is perfectly safe, whereas white's is going to be pretty tender. It can't go kingside, but it, it can't really go queenside either, so it, it's probably just going to hang out nervously in the center. Um, black has more than enough compensation for two pawns here. This is an overwhelming position for Knight c2, f5. Again, key move for the Sveshnikov. Keep fighting for the center. That pawn break with f5, 
is absolutely key in the session of. As we I've discussed in Hanging Pawns, your pawn breaks are your the engines of your play. Always look at your pawn breaks, and in certain opening variations, there are certain pawn breaks that are always the most important to look at. F5 is that pawn break for black. Always be looking at F5 when you're playing the Sveshnikov Sicilian. Three, notice that EXE F5 doesn't work. And, uh, black simply up, please. D3, F4, King H8. So material's even, but black has the bishop pair, he has an edge in space, he has a safer king. Uh, this is a decisive advantage for black. Now, this gets a little bit uneven, unfortunately. I'm going to guess that most gentlemen, both these gentlemen got into time pressure later in the game, uh, since neither side really chose optimally from here. But this is also a difficult position. Um, when you're playing an opening variation you're not familiar with, that also extends to the middle game, because an unfamiliar opening is going to lead to unfamiliar structures, which makes it harder and harder to choose the correct moves as you get deeper into the game, because those structures transfer into the middle game, and they still influence your thinking. So, even though they've gotten past the opening phase, they're both still digging through a position that's not completely familiar to them. Uh, which is difficult for both sides, but since Sveshnikov is the one doing the work in this variation, it definitely benefits him a bit more. One, Rook B8, this is a little bit inaccurate. B4 immediately. This move doesn't need to be prepared. And then... Knight d4 is better instead of chasing the stupid pawn. Uh, black has a humongous advantage here. This The white king on f1 is much less safe than the white, uh, black king on h8. Um, black is a very nice position. This is a near decisive initiative. So rook b8's a little bit passive. a5, preparing the b4 break. f7. Bishop c4, I really don't like... It's, it's not bad just yet, but in my opinion, it's a bad positional plan. Uh, this bishop on d3 is a very poor piece. It, it is probably white's worst piece. Uh, this bishop on f7 is black's good bishop, but here it really is his good bishop, because this bishop on g7 really doesn't do all that much. So to trade black's good bishop for white's bad bishop doesn't make a lot of positional sense. Now, it's not yet fatal to play this move, uh, but it, it it's the road to a bad idea. Um, so it, this is a wrong foot forward for black. Then knight d8, this truly gives away all of oh, black's still substantial advantage. Bishop b6 is just better. Just keeping the better bishop on the board, keeping this bad bishop on the board, and then achieve b4. You know, black still has a very large advantage here. Knight f3, just needs to simply trade. Then rook d2. Um, yeah, this, this is now completely equal. Um, White's managed to get his, his bad bishop off the board. Black no longer has his good bishop. Um, the b2 pawn is a weakness, uh, but now these white knights actually have some prospects. You know, this knight on e1 can dance from to f3 to h4 to f5, and that's dangerous for black. Uh, so knight f3 is not taking advantage of the situation. Bishop f6, again, I think both these gentlemen were in time pressure because uh, I think they're ignoring some fairly simple positional stri uh, strictures here. Bishop b3 is simply better. Just keep the good bishop on the board, keep the bad bishop on the board, and get after b4. Oh, black's still much better. Four. Not sure. And notice how quickly the position is turned. Now suddenly this white knight is hopping into f5. This knight on d8 is not terribly strong. Uh, black still has a target on b2, but that's completely overshadowed by this knight coming into f5. Uh, this is a better position for white suddenly. F7, and F5. F3 is a little bit better. It consolidates the position. And G4. I'm going to skip over some details here just to make sure the video doesn't go too long. You can check out the details in the notes. Uh, but notice that F3 is a very nice intermezzo here. Um, black will still get the piece back, but gaining that tempo against the white queen creates some mating threats. Um, just as background, I keep mentioning time pressure. I know I mentioned this a few in my other videos, but uh, the time control back in the 70s and 80s, I believe 1974, it would have been two and a half hours for each side to reach move 40, and then each side receives another hour each to finish the game. So when you look at older games like this from like 1920, 1930s up to about 1998 or so is when they started to change time controls. 
Um, that long ser uh, stretch of time, a lot of times games are nearing move 40, you start to see some very uneven play, because at that point time trouble becomes a factor. Um, i 99% convinced that would be the case here, because both gentlemen are not playing up to the usual capabilities, because they've spent so much time in the late opening and middle game, sort of struggling with this unfamiliar familiar, but razor-sharp position. But F3, very nice intermezzo, creating mating, th mating threats and time pressure. Queen H6, Queen C7, B4 is a little bit more safe. Rook XB2, and this is certainly a time pressure error. Uh, rook XB2 creates very, a very obvious tactical threat of Rook X F2 check. Uh, Vitaly uh, Sheshkovsky was a fantastic player. Um, so for him to overlook that, that's most certainly time pressure. Um, H4 is completely correct, because that prevents that Queen X H2 check follow-up on the sacrifice. So, one potential way to go. This is very uneasy equality. Both kings are so exposed that any progress from here is more or less impossible. Uh, this is going to be sort of a bloody stalemate. This is going to be a draw. But Queen C8, Rook F8... And then, very simple. Um, but in a way, this is quite logical, because this is still connected to what Black gained out of the opening. Black gained that F4 out, the pawn outpost from his opening play, which led to that F3 push gaining extra kingside space, which led to this eventual kingside sacrifice. Um, so in my eyes, this is still logically connected to how Black played the opening and what he gained from his opening risks. Uh, Rook has F2, this is a very direct and simple tactical blow, but in time pressure it's very easy to overlook this. Queen xh2, check. Notice that both the king moves get mated by queen e2 mate. Then rook g8, um, move 41, uh, time pressure's, uh, time control's reached, so here Shaskovsky just refined, because white's just, and black's just gonna queen in the next move. Um, this got to be a very uneven opening to er, er, uneven game towards the end, um, but I still think it's representative and a fine tribute to Sveshnikov's creation. Um, Sveshnikovsky is a world-class grandmaster uh, back in the 70s and 80s, and so he was completely overwhelmed by how to play against such an aggressive opening variation. This is such terra incognito for both sides, uh, but the fact that Sveshnikov is the one doing the work in this opening and delving into the secrets of this position uh, meant that he was getting s so many free dynamic attacks just because White had no idea how to handle this. Um, it's a great tribute to Sushnikov's imagination that a world-class player like Sheshkovsky had no idea how to handle this opening. So, um, so yeah, we're going to continue pay paying tribute to Sushnikov. He was one of my favorite players growing up, uh, so I definitely want to do him justice by showing some of his classic games. I think tomorrow we'll um, look at some more theoretical contributions from his from both the C3 Sicilian and the Advanced French. Um, so, I will see you tomorrow.